Why didn't the closest relative of, of Elimelech buy the land that Naomi was selling? This is the question we seek to answer today as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Ruth on Walking Through the Bible. Today we're going to be discussing Ruth 4, verses 1 to 12. Before we do that, let's read the passage. If you have a Bible with you, you can turn to Ruth chapter 4, verse 1. But if you don't have a Bible, don't worry. Just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So Ruth chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold a piece of land which had belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, On the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm anything, one man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore the close relative said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my, as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead uh, through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And you, may pro and you may prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. During a famine, Elimelech and Naomi, along with two of their sons, Malon and Chilion, departed to Moab in order to find food. While there, Malon married a Moabite named Ruth, while Chilion made, married a Moabite woman named Orpah. All three men died while in Moab, leaving Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah, childless widows. Such was a sad state for women at that time, for inheritance rights were generally through sons, not wives, and as such, these women could be destitute. Naomi decided to go back to Bethlehem once the famine was over, and after much discussion, Ruth decided to go with her. Orpah stayed in Moab. When the women arrived in Bethlehem, Ruth gleaned in the field of Boaz in order for the women to eat. Boaz was a close kinsman of Elimelech, and so Naomi convinced Ruth to seek out Boaz that he become what is known as a kinsman redeemer and raise up children for her in a form of marriage that is known as leveret marriage. We saw, that, we saw this discussed in Deuteronomy, but in order to refresh our memories, let's reread Deuteronomy 25 verses 5 to 10. If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as his wife, and perform the duties of her husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed of the name of, is, to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out in Israel. But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of, this, of his city shall call him and speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, and answer and say, So shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. 
and his name shall be called in Israel the house of him who had his sandal removed. Now Boaz, a faithful man himself to the law of Moses, was willing to fulfill this role for Ruth, but before he could do that, he must first approach the one who is of closer kin to Elimelech than he was. Which brings us to chapter 4. Boaz is at the city gates in the presence of the elders, discussing the matter with Elimelech's closest relative. Boaz tells this relative that Naomi has come back from Moab and has to sell the piece of land that belongs to Elimelech due to her poverty. Now, under the law, according to Leviticus 25, land wasn't truly sold like we think of land sales. Rather, it was sold for a reasonable value of the number of crops between then and the year of Jubilee. The person who bought the land could then use the land until the next Jubilee, after which the land would be returned to the family that originally possessed it. So this is what Naomi was doing. But remember, something else is at play. Land was inherited by sons, but Naomi had no living sons, and neither did Ruth, Naomi's daughter-in-law. Following Numbers 25, verses 8 to 11, the land that was Elimelech's was to pass to Elimelech's nest of kin, which in this case was the man we're currently talking to in Ruth 4. What right did Naomi have of selling the land then? And why would the man who should have possessed the land anyway have to buy it? Well, Numbers 25 doesn't say when the land would be possessed, passed to the next of kin, so it seems the tradition arose the land wouldn't change possession to the next of kin in, in that case until the death of the widow so as not to impoverish her. Thus, even though the next of kin might have received this land, that would be in the future, not at the present time. At the present time, he had the right to purchase this land from Naomi in order to assist her in her time of poverty. In the beginning, the man agreed to do this, but when Boaz said that if he purchased the land, it also came with the obligation of marrying Ruth and raising up a child in Ruth's dead husband's name, the man refused, saying that it would ruin his own inheritance. Why? Well, let's think about this for a moment. The land of Elimelech was going to cost him money, but he, if he was going to inherit this land anyway sometime down the road, on the whole, he and his descendants would become richer. Therefore, this investment now would be helping out Naomi in her time of need and would enrich the, his family too in the long run. However, if the next of kin had to raise up a child with Ruth, that son would now inherit Elimelech's land, meaning that the next of kin would be significantly poor and with no new land to show for it. It is obvious that this man was not wealthy enough to make such a purchase, so he had to decline. But the law back in Deuteronomy 25 still applied. And so the writer of Ruth, writing sometime in the future, perhaps about 150 years in the future, had to explain the custom that seemed to have disappeared in Israel during his time, which was the removal of the sandal as the sign of the next of kin's renouncement of his duty concerning raising up children with Ruth. Now we don't read of the man being spit upon, which could have been an omission here or simply not have been done, due to the fact that the next of kin doesn't appear to be acting out of greed, but out of preservation of his own children's inheritance. Whatever the case, Boaz was now free to marry Ruth and carry out the duty of a kinsman redeemer. The city rejoiced at this, wishing that Ruth bear many children like Leah and Rachel, Jacob's, uh, who were Jacob's wives. They also wished that Boaz's house prosper and be made famous in Bethlehem. Little did they know how famous Boaz's house would become, something we'll discuss, the Lord willing, in the next lesson. With that, our time is up for today. The Lord willing, we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's discussion of Ruth chapter 4, verses 13 to 22, as we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world. Amen.